Scripture reading before the sermon comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. False teachers have scarred the minds of the masses regarding just about everything religious you can think of, but especially about the Bible and money. Well, what do you mean? I mean this. Almost everyone that hears some sort of a preacher mention money assumes that a prosperity gospel message is sure to follow. So I want you to consider these questions. Number one, as recorded in the books of Matthew Mark, Luke, and John, did Jesus talk more about money or baptism? You know the answer to that. He talked more about money. Now, that's not to say that baptism isn't important. It is. But when you look at what Jesus talked about, what did he talk more about? Money or baptism? The answer is money. Now, through the years, have you heard more sermons on money or on baptism? You know what I would say? baptism. You're going to hear it at the end of this sermon if I'm alive to say it. Now here's the point. The Lord doesn't have to say something 10,000 times before it's important. If the Lord only talked about money one time, is that enough? Yes. If the Lord only mentioned baptism one time, is that enough? Yes. Now I want to ask you this. What happens if your baptism is wrong? You're in trouble. Because Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So our baptism has to be right in harmony with Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, since we understand the importance of baptism, answer me this question. Will the misuse of money cost you your soul? <coughs> yes. Yes, indeed, it will. Now, there are at least four types of attitudes developed when hearing that God expects us to turn loose of at least some of our money. Number one, there are the resentful. That's those who despise all sermons on giving, thinking that there are more important subjects to consider which means they'd have really had a problem with Jesus. Number two, there's the regretful. Those who listen but wish they hadn't because they'll walk out of here feeling like a thief, feeling like they've robbed God. Number three, there are the reasonable. Those who are willing to consider all of what the Bible teaches about everything from money to baptism to whatever else the Bible discusses. And then number four, the right. Those who understand what the Bible teaches about money give accordingly and will continue to do so so long as God blesses them with money and life. So we're going to be discussing the broad concept of giving this month. Yay! <laughs> I'm just as excited about it as you are. <laughs> but it needs to be done. So today we're going to talk about giving graciously. We're going to discuss three things and here's the first one. Giving graciously demands the right message. 
Someone once said that great leaders are not born, they're made. And that's pretty true. The same principle is also true with giving graciously. Gracious givers are not born, they're taught. They're taught what the New Testament teaches about giving. While many walk by sight and not by faith. Now you understand that's an inversion of 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. But the truth is many are walking by sight and not by faith, which means that they're members of the Lord's church simply because their parents were. They give weekly, perhaps, simply because their parents gave. But the point is, we must become a member of the Lord's church because we individually understand that the Lord's church is right. The church of Christ is the church built and paid for by Jesus Christ. And we also need to understand that we give for the same reason. We don't give because mommy and daddy gave. We give because we understand individually what the Bible teaches about the Christian and money. Now, think about this, brethren. What would happen if we stopped preaching Mark 16, 16? What if we said, you know what? Mark 16, 16 is divisive. We understand Jesus said it, but we're not going to preach publicly Mark 16, 16 anymore. Number one, Jesus himself is going to be upset with us. And number two, broadly speaking, nothing positive is going to happen. Do you understand that? So what happens when we stop preaching? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. What happens when we stop preaching that? Nothing positive. Now think, what has happened since we have not emphasized all the truth about giving? What has happened? We have let the false teachers preach a false prosperity gospel, and I guess we've taken in our minds, well, if we talk about money, that's divisive. We're going to be lumped in with the false teachers, so let's just not say anything about it. Let's talk about everything else. Based on everything I could find, most estimate that 85% of the contribution comes from 15% of the people. Now explain that. Think about that. Let that sink in just for a second because I think most of us could honestly say at least 85% of the work is done by about 15% of the people. You think it's any different with the contribution? Apparently it is not. I, now let me state this as a disclaimer. I don't know who gives what. I, that's not true. I know what my family gives because I write the check. I know what one family out of everybody here gives, and that's only because I write the check. I don't count the money. I don't know who gives what, where, when, or how. That's not my business. My business is to preach what the Bible teaches. Now let me give you some scriptures from Jesus himself. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's Matthew 6, 19 through 21. You could make the case that Matthew 6, 33 is really the focal point of the entire Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6.33, when you begin to think about it, is really the focal point of everything that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7. Have you thought about that? Think about what Jesus says and what he is teaching throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. But it's culminated in Matthew 6 and verse 33. And if you don't know what it says, turn to it and read it. But I want to show you something that Paul encouraged Timothy to do in the book of 1 Timothy. So let's look in 1 Timothy chapter 6 very quickly. Can we seek first the kingdom of God when we don't give God our money? I say our money. It's God's money. He's loaned it to us. And he expects us to be good stewards with the things that he's given us. He's going to take care of us. That's what Matthew 6, 33 teaches. But look what Paul encourages Timothy to preach. In 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 17, he says, Charge them that are rich in this world. By and large, that would be any person who's an American citizen. I don't think we really realize how rich we really are as American citizens. 
charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Who's the giver? God is the giver. Does God expect us to be givers? Yes, because he's a giver. Verse number 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate or willing to share, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now what happens if we don't do those things? We're going to have a hard time laying hold on eternal life, aren't we? Aren't we? Yes. So in order to give graciously, we have to have the right message. Well, what is the right message? It's whatever the Bible teaches. And specifically, the New Testament. So we have to teach all the counsel of God, from baptism to money to anything else that the Bible deals with. Now, second. Giving graciously demands the right motive. Now, why are we here this morning? What influenced us to be here today? I don't know the answer to that other than anybody but me. Hopefully, we're all here because we want to please God. But I don't know why you're here. I, I tell you what I want to believe. I want to believe you're here because you want to be here. Because you've made a conscious effort to say, Hey, I know what the Bible teaches regarding the Lord's church. I know what the Bible teaches regarding worship. I want to be where God's people are. And that's hopefully why you're here this morning. But I don't know that. But let me ask you a few other questions. Why did Paul encourage the churches of Macedonia to give graciously? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. From one aspect, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit probably to do so. What was his ultimate motivation? Well, you could obviously answer that and say he was inspired, but did, did, he, did his personal feelings have something to do with it? Sometimes it may have. Why does he mention the churches of Macedonia to the church at Corinth? Why is he beginning, and we're going to see, he's going to make a comparison of sorts. He's going to mention the churches of Macedonia to the church at Corinth. Why would he do that? Well, the simple answer is he was speaking by inspiration, writing rather, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. In Acts 11, verses 28 through 30, Agabus the prophet declared that there would be a severe famine. And the inspired writer of Acts, most likely Luke the beloved physician, declares that it came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Paul, perhaps by inspiration, perhaps by personal motivation, saw an opportunity to improve Jew and Gentile relations within the church. Here was, here was what he did. Have the Gentiles send a sum of money to the Jews in Judea. Because apparently Paul had been in Judea. He had been really all over the world. And apparently in Judea it was bad. And Paul says, either by inspiration or personal motivation... Let's help bring people together. How are we going to do that? Send money. A pretty smart way, wouldn't you think? Now look in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, that is, we're making this known to you, of the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, bestowed on the churches, plural, that is not different denominations, but different congregations of the Lord's people, on the churches of Macedonia. There are two that you know and you don't know that you know. That's the church at Philippi. Hence the book of Philippians was written to the church at Philippi. But then you have First and Second Thessalonians. Those who were members of the church in the city of Thessalonica. So no doubt Philippi and Thessalonica were two cities where there were congregations of the Lord's people in that broad region of Macedonia. Now look, look carefully. How that in a great trial of affliction, these people were suffering. The abundance of their joy. Now there's a lesson there. You can be in physical pain, emotional pain, any kind of pain, and you can still have joy. Because that's exactly what these people were going through. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and, oh no, you didn't know this was in the Bible, did you? Joy and their deep poverty. 
poverty. Now, let's be real. Do you know anyone who lives in poverty? And if you do, would you say that it's deep poverty? Now, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, says that the churches of Macedonia were having a hard time. But they still had joy, and they were in deep poverty. But look what they did. Abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now, the Holy Spirit says that these congregations and the people are the ones who comprise those congregations were living in deep poverty and they still found money to give. How do you explain that? It's the grace of God. God had bestowed unmerited favor upon these people. They were having a hard time. They were in deep poverty and they still had money to give. Verse 3, For to their power, that is their ability, I bear record, meaning this is an inspired statement, so you know it's true. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves praying us. It seems that they came up with a sum of money and told Paul, please take this. Please take this. We want to help out our brethren across the other side of the world, so to speak. Hundreds of miles away. We want to help out. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. What's the gift? It's a sum of money. And take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They gave out of their love for the truth. And there's a subtle indication there that Paul knew. These people don't have anything. These people are living in deep poverty. But Paul, because he was consistent, he taught the same message in every church. That's in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Go read it and see. He taught the same message. So he taught the same message in Philippi and Thessalonica, though they were in deep poverty, and they said, you know what? We've got money. We don't have much, but we're begging you, please take our money so that our friends, or perhaps even our fellow brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters, can be helped out. Now that's amazing. But let's keep reading. Verse number five. And this they did, not as we hoped. I mean, Paul's almost like, we don't expect much out of you guys, and it's not because of teaching them a different gospel or a different message. It's because they didn't have much. This they did, not as we hope, but here's the key. You want to be a gracious giver? Read this. But first, it says first. What does first mean? First means first. First gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us, inspired men, by the will of God. This is the key to giving graciously, even in deep poverty. What do you do? What they do? They first gave their own selves to the Lord. They realized if anything, where, do every, where does every good gift and every perfect gift come from? It comes from above, from the Father of lights. They gave themselves to the Lord, and then the Lord says, here, you need to give back. And they said, okay, we're not going to squabble about it, we're not going to fight about it, we're going to give. In so much, verse number 6, that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you, the church of Christ at Corinth, the same grace also. What do you think that grace is? That grace is giving. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, there's a, there's a comparison here. Apparently, obviously, the churches of Macedonia were in deep poverty. The implication is the church at Corinth was well-to-do. They had a substantial contribution. But when you begin to look at it, it was the churches of Macedonia that were really going above and beyond, and Corinth was given the scraps. Even though they had a great big pile to give, they weren't giving graciously. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, See that ye abound in this grace also. Again, what is the same grace and this grace? It refers to giving. Therefore what? Giving is a grace. And since giving is a grace, we need to do it graciously. Now third, giving graciously demands the right master. I want to read to you some saddening statistics. The median household income in the United States of America is less than $60,000. But for the sake of our study, we're going to round it up. To $60,000. That means about half the people, households that is, half the households make more than that, half the households make less than that. So $60,000, it's actually a little less. 
but we're going to round it up to 60000 The average charitable contribution, that includes the contribution here, that includes the things that you give away to places like Goodwill, that includes everything, is a little less than 4%. But for the sake of our study, we're going to round it up to 4%. Do you know what the math is? That means the average household in the United States of America gives all of $2,400 a year for a charitable income. That breaks down to a whopping $46 per week. $46 per week. Now let me give you something else to think about. As of 2015, so this is a little dated, the average American family spent over $3,000 a year on prepared food, not groceries. I'm not talking about food line. I'm not talking about Walmart. I'm talking about prepared food, McDonald's, Olive Garden. You fill in the blank. Prepared food, over $3,000 a year, which that breaks down to $57 a week. Brethren, help me see that. Help me see how it's right to give the Lord $46 a week when we're spending $57 a week on fast food. How is that right? I'm not saying $57 a week on fast food is wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying how is $46 a week to the Lord right? How is that right in view of the fact that by and large we as a whole spend $57 a week on prepared food? I don't see it. And I'm afraid that the average person is not going to be able to explain that successfully to Jesus Christ. That's why we need to deal with it here before we step into eternity and have to deal with him there. How are we going to explain that? What would, what would we say? I don't know. How could any person, or family for that matter, successfully claim to be a diehard dedicated follower of Jesus Christ when spending more on prepared food than on charitable contributions, which definitely includes the first day of the week collection. I don't know. You know what my goal is? I'm not going to have to try and explain that to Jesus. That's my goal. The Lord has a sum of money in his mind that he expects from me and my family, and I better figure out what it is and give at least that and try to exceed that as best as possible. Did Jesus tell the truth in Matthew 6, 21? you remember what he said? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let me give you some sad news. This place is going to burn up. It's going to melt from the fervent heat. When the Lord comes back, it's gone. It's gone. So everything that we may be laboring to store up here, listen, it's going to grow old. Your children are going to squander it. They're going to break it or the Lord's coming back and it's burn up anyway. What then? Did Jesus tell the truth in Matthew 6, 24? No man can serve two masters. For either he will love the one and hate the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. Wealth, riches, fame. Did Jesus tell the truth? Yes, he's told the truth. So the battle we fight every single day involves who we allow to rule our heart. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and bringing into captivity every thought. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What our job is as New Testament Christians is to say, I may have these walls built in my mind, but the gospel has to pull them down. I may have preconceived ideas in my mind about my God and his money, but whatever the Bible teaches pulls them down. And whatever the Bible teaches about it settles it. Ultimately, either Satan rules us or God rules us. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form, that pattern of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became something. What did you become? The servants of righteousness. 
Do we serve the Lord? Well, we better. Where does every good gift and every perfect gift come? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1, 17, Romans 6, 16 to 18. How many more would it take? Brethren, the ruler, the master, the God of our heart is clearly demonstrated in how we distribute the money God has given to us. It is very accurate to open up the checkbook and to give the checkbook test or the, the bank ledger test, however it is. I understand we have to live in this life. I understand we have to have a roof over our heads. I understand we have to eat. But where does the Lord come into that equation? Anywhere, $46 a week. That's, that's how much our life means to us. That's how much God has blessed us. Less than 4%. It's amazing, isn't it? It's a little scary. 1 Timothy 6.10 is still in the Bible. And it still says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, it may be the case that more people lose their souls over money than everything else put together. Have you thought about that? Fact. We rule the money or the money rules us. We cannot give graciously when money rules us. It can't happen. Since it's true that Jesus is our example in all things, we must ask, who was the master of Jesus? Well, Jesus served the Father. Jesus' master was not money, was it? No, we need to do the same. We need to start just as those people in Macedonia did. They first gave themselves to the Lord. Have you given yourself to the Lord? Let me give you God's test of honesty and see how you come out. You've got to hear the truth. Acts 18, 8. You've got to believe the truth. Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin. Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Brethren, Acts 8.22 is still in the Bible. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Come now, as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.